Wow, that was the Bay Area's own Raina Ivester, title track called Recipe, uh, Beautiful Woman. We're going to be talking to her shortly. She is our guest on Give Life, Save Life. Uh, this is Valerie B. in the pilot seat, sitting in for Brother Keith, who's out on assignment this Thursday, but he is with us in heart and spirit. So uh, good afternoon, Brother Keith. Uh, also next week, Brother Keith will be joining us from the Chocolate City, Washington, D.C., as he and a few other uh, Jefferson Award winners are being honored uh, with the fancy gala for their contributions and achievements in giving back to the community. So big shout out and kudos to those people who are doing good things. Want to say hello to our Give Life, Save Lives correspondent, Rin Monroe. Hello. What's going on, girl? Hi. Looking beautiful as usual. Oh, thank um, you. She has her segment coming up, Calling the Kettle Black. And last week we touched on some really interesting uh, facts about the triple A's. And Rin's going to go back into that and get into more depth uh, later on in her show. Uh, want to give a couple of shots out to my father, Hiawatha Butler Sr. He's my hero always. Love you, Dad. Want to say hello to our people over there at 1111 Broadway, YVM, the Yums, <laughs> um, and all of our listeners, uh, Give Life, Save Life family members, and all of our KPOO radio listeners as well. Uh, we have a great show today, so we're just going to go into it. Uh, I do want to, um, before I forget, because this is very important, I want all of you all to check out the San Francisco Black Film Festival, uh, June 11th through the 14th. Uh, lot of great talent go out and support your african-american filmmakers if you want more information go to sfbff.org for schedules information and venues all right so moving forward uh i i'm sure that all of us have uh, seen it or heard of the incident that happened in mckinney texas where a police officer brutally attacked a young 14-year-old African-American um, young girl, uh, uh, probably a 100 pounds to his 300 pounds. Um, it was a brutal attack. I'm not going to get into why it happened or what caused it to happen, but all I can say is whatever happened, it didn't call for that type of action on that young lady. And watching that, for me and I'm sure others, that was not just her mother's daughter, that's everybody's daughter that we were looking at. So it's really powerful. But with that, you know, I'm looking at that officer manhandling her and, and doing those things to her. And, you know, there's different types of bullying, you know, um, there's different types of bullying. And, and I believe that was a physical type of bullying. I mean, there was no way she could defend herself. You know, um, no matter what she said or did to this guy didn't warrant that. So I think he was a big bully and a coward. And with that, I am going to bring on our guest and welcome uh, Raina to our show, who is uh, a quite talented lady, as you heard. But she has a very interesting story to share with us about bullying and, you know, how it's affected her and, and where it put her today. So welcome aboard, Raina. Hi. Hello. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm good. So, so well, um, I know that you have um, a story to tell us about your childhood and being bullied by not just a bunch of people, but a certain person, you know, that right. ended up bullying you as you got older. So just briefly get us into that and, and, you know, let us know, you know, where that puts you now. Well, I had an interesting childhood. I had a great childhood behind the scenes, but in school, for some reason, I stood out. And because of that, people didn't really understand me. They picked on me for certain things, the way I talked or the way that I carried myself. So therefore, it really messed with my self-esteem, especially when it came from people who looked like me, mm -hmm. you know, from my own, my own race. Right. So it made it really difficult. And for an example, I had a story. There was a girl who I went to school with, and um, we were kind of friendly, never really talked, but always spoke to each other. And then um, when we got to high school, things kind of changed, and she began to attack me mm -hmm. verbally. Um, for four months 
and I would try and try to talk with her. I talked with the principal. I talked to the counselor. We sat down several times, and I would explain to her, you know, like, I don't have a problem with you. You know, we were friends. I don't understand, you know, where this is coming from. Mm -hmm. And um, she would never respond. So it came to the point where um, she ended up attacking me, fighting me. And it was a day, it was the last day before Christmas break. So that was the day that all the kids came to school because it was known to have like fights and people just, right. you know, act up because we have the break. <laughs> so um, that day I was absent for most of the day. And when I came back, I kind of heard something like a, a rumor circling that there's going to be a fight. Right. So I wasn't sure who the fight was going to be with, um, but it happened to be with me. And there was a girl who I thought was my friend at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I asked her, I said, um, can you please walk with me? Um, you know, I just want to make sure someone's with you. She's like, right. oh, yeah. you know." So you, you had a feeling? I had a certain just kind of feeling. You didn't know who I wasn't, would. I didn't know. I wasn't sure. Because things had kind of died down a little bit. Uh -huh. So the girl was like, oh, yeah, I'll walk with you. And then she walked me directly to the fight to the lines to the, exactly oh. and i was attacked and of course i i lost the fight i had never fought before and it was so embarrassing and it really messed with my self-esteem and my confidence and my trust because i have here we are with these girls who i thought were my friends mm -hmm. and um after the fight was over um the principal came and got me up and um they were praising her wow and from that day forward, it was like I was the easy target. So everybody wanted to have some reason to fight me. To just because it would be easy for them to get that, I don't know, recognition. Right. So um, it took me a long time to really build back my self-esteem and, and really trust. And trust. It took a long, a long time. It was really hard for me. But I tried my best to um, just keep my head up. Wow. Let me just quickly, because I want to talk some more about um, the effects that it's had on right. you, but I did uh, pull up some statistics about bullying. Um, and it says that bully victims are between two and times more, two times more likely to commit suicide, uh, you know, among other people, you know, the pe victims of bullying. Right. Uh, mostly 10 through 14 year old go girls are at a higher rate for suicide. Mm hmm. Uh, Thirty percent are either bullies or victims of bullying. Uh, Seventy-seven percent of students are verbally uh, bullied. Eighty percent of high school students now are cyber bullied. Right. While only twenty to thirty percent of students tell parents that they are being bullied. So, getting to that really quick, did you share with your parents or or, or some other authorities at the school of what was going on and I did um, I shared with my mom of course and that's why she fought for them to continue to bring us into the counselor's office to figure out what was going on and um, I never thought that it would have ended up in a fight because we never had an argument right. we never talked about it we never hung out it was never really any issue so at the end of the fight the police had to get involved because it was, you know, it was, it could have, it was that brutal. And so how old were you? I was 14. Time? It was my okay. first year in high school, my mm -hmm. uh, first semester. Had you known this young lady before the high school or did you meet her? I knew there. her. Okay. I wouldn't say I knew, like knew her, right. knew her, but we had a PE period together okay. in eighth grade. Okay. So she knew so of So she you. knew of me and right. I knew of her, right. but never any issues. Mm -hmm. So at the end of it. It came out finally. We're sitting down with the police officer, the principal, me, my mother, um, and she says it was over a boy. She saw me walking home with this boy that she liked, mm -hmm. and that boy happened to be my neighbor. And my mother. And she assumed. That and she assumed that I was, I liked him. I guess I was her boyfriend. I had no idea. Right. So at all of, after all of that, after all those meetings um, of talking and trying to get things out of her, she would never say and then she waited till the end and said this was over so oh boy was this years later no this was at the end of the fight okay at she, the end of the fight yeah so then i have a question for you rain and i'm just gonna ask it uh -huh. so it seems like this person who was slash your friend but your nemesis as well i mean because you guys had dealings together on and off even before the 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 fight I mean, you knew. High and by. Okay, okay. A high and okay, by. Okay, okay. Yeah, that was about it. So then moving forward, mm -hmm. um, had you ever met up with her again? You know, because sometimes when we're younger and 
you know, we're very, you know, susceptible to abuse and, you know, because we're cowering and then you get older and you get that. Right. It's like, oh, I, w- I can't wait till I see that person <laughs> again. I'll tell, you know, because you're not, you're not afraid anymore. So right. have there ever been a time where not so much to be aggressive towards her, but, you know, put your big girl pants on now and it's like, well, here I am now. And, you know, what was that all about? I've never seen her again. I never saw her again after that. Um, The only person who picked on me that I now have a relationship with, um, it was uh, it was funny. We're in the car one day with a mutual friend, and she was talking about me. And I'm Mm -hmm. just like, why is she saying all these things about me? And I'm like, I'm right here, you know, about my skin being too black and my eyes are too big. Just you know, physical, just weird things. Mm-hmm. And so I waited until everyone got out the car. This was three years after I, um, after that first fight, mm-hmm. because I knew what it's like to be public, right. public humiliated. So I was, let me wait and talk to her in private. And so I explained to her about how I felt and how you know those words hurt me. And she apologized. And that's the only person that's ever apologized to me and actually acknowledged that they were wrong. So now me and her have a really close relationship, mm-hmm. and um, I'm helping her raise her daughter. Right. So and, and and it seems like some of the studies show that, and and it goes both ways that most bullied are bulliers. Mm-hmm. You know, they have a very negative upbringing, and you know their household is not also uh, flowers and roses. You know, and so right. it's it's taking out their aggression and, right. and towards other people who are less likely to be able to stand up to them exactly because probably where they're from they can't stand up so exactly it's, it's the survival of the fittest now i'm going to go and, and and beat you down mm-hmm. but um a few things like i said um there's there's three types of a view uh of bullying but i believe i don't know if cyber bullying would be in one of these now with the new internet you know, it and all actually that. it would be okay I feel like there's verbal bullying, there's uh, physical, there's mental, and then, of course, there's the cyberbullying. Right. That ties into the mental. Right. Uh, Ren, yes. you had a, a, um, a story to share about um, some bullying that happened to you when you were a younger girl. Oh, there are many. Just, well, just quickly, just I'll quickly tell you the, the main one. one. That sticks out. Uh, I know I was probably 12, and my parents made me work. <laughs> I had to work um, for money, you know, for my own little spending money, and I had to have straight A's. So my mom said to me, if you'll do that, then I'll get you whatever you want to wear for school. So I did that. I bring home my straight A's. I work my little part-time job. And she gets me these five pair of jeans, okay, Calvin Klein, Jordache, Gloria Vanderbilt, Sergio Valente, and then Levi's always fit in. So I had my school. Yeah. Yeah, Then I get a letter from from the girls around me. They're black. And it says, we hate you because you wear designer jeans mm. and you think you're white they signed the letter <laughs> but i mean back they then they thought i mean yeah. that was really something but just you know the the writing of the letter you know who, who takes but time it, but it was black right. and white we hate you because yeah. you you're, you're black and you think you're white yeah. i mean right. how much clearer can that be Ray? it can't be more white. well you didn't get the message uh, well i got the message when they formed <laughs> a circle around me one day and each took a turn spitting on me oh wow well, yeah I mean that's I could I mean that's almost worse than you know being physically hit. Yeah, I just and, stood and there and looked straight ahead. First of all, I was in disbelief, and and like you said, even the ones I thought were my friends took a turn too. So then let's let's talk about something too because bullying is in all races, all cultures. Very you know, true. Mm-hmm. I was even reading that you know overseas and in China and Japan, you know, they're acting up. Mm-hmm. You know, mm. but what about when it comes down to the African Americans? You know, we you know we have enough uh, uh, things to deal with. You know, just just being here, and then you got somebody else picking on you, and it's like, hey, what's the matter? We're the same. Exactly. So, I mean, how does that impact um, an African American young 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 woman? You know what I'm saying? Right. With everything else going on, I mean, like you said, with your self esteem issues, but yeah. of course. And I, I'm going to let you, but you, you, you've rose above that because you're right. doing great things. And we'll talk about that later, but just really quickly. Um, I feel like that has a deeper effect because I was actually only bullied by other African-Americans. So it made me really confused because it's like, okay, you don't like me because my skin is too dark. And then I talk white. <laughs> but, you know, I, I wanted to be so much like them. So I never really understood. So it really messed me up. I, it, it took me longer to find myself and to really be true to myself. I was afraid to dream out loud. I was afraid to really share who I really was just because it's like, here's another thing 
that they're going to break me down for. Right. You know, I already talk white. I, my, I had long hair, so it was like, oh, your hair's a weave. You're too skinny. Mm-hmm. Your eyes are too big. Well, it was just nothing You're right about you. Yeah, yeah, I was just like, can I have a... B-? My ears were too small. I'm like, okay. <laughs> my ears aren't big, but now right. they're too right. small. What else? Come on, bring it. <laughs> yeah. Bring you know? it. Is that all so you got? It was, it, it was very hard, mm-hmm. and it's very sad because I love, I love black people. I do. I love all my sisters and my brothers, even the ones now that have impacted my life in a negative way. Mm-hmm. I still have love for them because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be sitting here right, right now because it's motivated me. Well, let me ask you, Raina, um, you know, with with what you shared with us, uh, the things that were happening with you as a young black woman. Uh-huh. Two things. What can you say and you too, Ren, mm-hmm. you know, what, what can you say to the young um, people out there in general who are being bullied, but specifically, you know, young African-American um, women? You know, I mean, bullying, there's adult bullying and teenage bullying. So I'm saying bullying in general. But as far as you and Ren, when you were growing up at te- as teenagers, mm-hmm. what could you say that can help? the people today that, that might be experiencing that uh, in, in, in terms of trying to rise above it and get over it or find resources or, you know, what's out there for them to help them? Well, what helped me was I really had to learn how to love myself Mm -hmm. and I had to get to know my history. I took every history class, black history class in college that I could take. And it really helped me understand why things are the way they are. And people look past it and say that things have changed, but they haven't. You know, all of this stems from our history, from slavery, all of that. So it made me look at people differently Mm -hmm. and I got to know the communities and why things run the way they do. How come there's not a grocery store on East 14th? Mm -hmm. You know, why Mm -hmm. is it just a liquor store? And that ties into everybody's behavior. So I really had to just learn how to love my culture, love my people, understand them and just look past it and just love them. Mm -hmm. And I try to smile um, at women. Beautiful smile. You know, I mean, (laughs) This is such a gorgeous she's lady, stunning. and yeah. I love it because she's a great representation of an African-American black woman who is about something. I mean, who can be a role model, who's overcome things. So that's that's real special. And I know that, Ren, a lot of what she was um, talking on, especially learn more, you know, read about your history. Mm-hmm. Uh, we spoke about that on one of the other shows in the Kettle Black. Right. So I understand how important that is. So what we're going to do right now, we have a lot more to uh, share with you all uh, about our Bay Area's Miss Raina. Um, and coming up, we're going to um, talk about what she's doing music wise. And um, we're looking forward to that. Be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to Give Life, Save Life. 
And that was, again, our Raina. And that tune was entitled, How Can I Say No? Earlier we heard um, a real sexy song called uh, Recipe. So we're going to get into that and ask Raina uh, what's going on moving forward. Um, so Raina, what's going on? Well, first, I'd like to give a little shout out to um, Reverend Dr. Julia Burns Robinson, who was my grandmother. I was just saying that um, I like to learn a lot about our history. And she was someone who really, really motivated me. It was one of my number one role models on how I wanted to be as an adult and how I wanted to carry myself. And she um, had her Ph.D. She had two masters, her bachelor's. She was a businesswoman. She was a woman of God, and she was a woman of education. So I just want to say shout out to her because she and has led me here. And obviously a great role model. Yes, a you. great, great, great role model. I love her to death. I pray for, her, I pray to her every day. I talk to her every day, and she's still right. with me. And quickly, I heart. just wanted to share with the audience that I thought it was so cute when I was speaking to Rain and Ren and I, and she said that she can't remember her grandmother ever not going to school. <laughs> so yeah. again, all of you out there that think you can't do it, that's given up, and you know. Take uh, take take heed from Raina's grandmother. You, you know, there's always time. You can always get more education because you never know everything. You, right, exactly. Right. Okay. So with that, Miss um, Raina. Yes. I love both the tracks. Thank um, you. Thank you so very much. Very sexy, Ooh. different, <laughs> but uh, the recipe. Yes, the first the, recipe. the first track that that's we the heard. track that's out now. So yes. And um, uh, you know what you talking about all kind of ingredients, a little mm, bit of this and that. This. <laughs> so, what inspired the recipe? Well, hmm. <laughs> well, you don't have to tell me all. <laughs> don't tell me everything. I'm not gonna tell you everything. Okay. But um, what inspired that? Well, I thought the track, the beat, was very sexy to me mm -hmm. and kind of sneaky. Right. So, um, honestly, a lot of my music is about love. Because I feel like I'm, I'm writing to my future husband. Because I'm single. And I was always a friend that was pretty much single. So I love writing about love because that's what I want. So it's the recipe. Exactly. So um, the recipe is like, you know, I have the right ingredients to keep you happy and oh. mentally. And I like that. Maybe. I might have to use that. It's <laughs> like, honey, I got a recipe for you. You know? So uh, just a good mixture of. Sugar and spice and everything nice. <laughs> yeah, that that usually <laughs> makes it good. Yeah. So moving forward, what's going on with you and and, and your upcoming uh, uh, engagements? I know that you're a very busy young lady. Yes, um, I am. With your music career and by the sounds of it, you're going to be doing big things Thank before we you. know it. So she was here first, Bay Area. You yes. heard it here first. <laughs> Well, I just released, I leaked a track um, recipe. Um, so that's circulating now, getting the buzz going. And then moving forward, I am in the process of shooting a video to that. And then my EP will be dropping the end of this summer. Ooh, that's just perfect. Yeah, um, yeah, so I'm excited about that. And I have been building my resources for years before I decided to really come out to the world. Like, this is what I want to do. This is me. This is who Raina really is. So. Right. I'm just working on really putting myself out there and getting those right connections. And um, I've been back and forth in L.A. just networking and working with different people and meeting people. So hopefully um, when my EP drops, um, you'll start seeing me do shows. And well, all and more than that, that, you'll be coming back on uh, Give Life, Save Life yes, because I now will. you're a family member. Oh, so thank you. you have to thank come you. back and visit us. I would love to come back. I have many, many, many stories that I could share. So right. I and and we're that. looking forward to that. Thank um, you. So... Um, again, uh, listen out, look forward to Raina Ivester, and she is Bay Area's own uh, up-and-coming black sister, overcame a lot, and, you know, so just all the, th all the things that you're doing music-wise, and I'm sure you're doing other things, but just from where she came from, the bullying, you know, and uh, the loss of self-esteem for a while and trust issues, she's brought herself back up, beautiful lady, uh, great role model. Thank we're you. excited and <laughs> we're so glad that we had you on and we'll be looking forward to having you on again. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. All right. So we're going to uh, go ahead and take a little intermission and coming back with Ren Monroe's Kettle Black, we will be revisiting the Triple A's. Well, what can I say? It's different. 
Welcome back. This is Ren Monroe, and of course, you're listening to S to KPOO 89.5 in San Francisco. I'm part of Give Life, Save Life. Valerie B is here, and so is All right. Raina Investor. Very Hello. nice. <laughs> this is the Kettle Black segment, and I'm hearing from some of the audience. First of all, let me say to the Give Life, Save Life audience, Thank you, thank you for the warm reception I've received. It means a lot to me. Uh, and so I'm hearing that some of you wanted me to expound a bit more on the triple A's we covered last week. Right, and we're not talking about no auto insurance. We are not talking about <laughs> auto insurance. <laughs> the triple A's, we're talking about the way the brain works. And they stand for availability, accessibility, and applicability. So your brain is a computer pretty much. And it, at any given moment, it's dealing with billions of bits of information. Mm -hmm. But it can't afford to do that every time you encounter a new situation. So what it does is it's called being a cognitive miser. It's going to scan the first time everything. You walk into a new building, it's going to scan everything. Mm -hmm. And then wherever you sit, wherever you feel safe, whoever you meet, have you noticed that when you go back, you tend to do the same thing? I think Raina's sitting in the chair she was in last time. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. I have you noticed it? My comfort zone. Right. It's your comfort zone. Yeah. But the, your brain has already scanned this, and that's where you want to be. So it doesn't need to do it again. So then let me ask you just really quick on that. Yeah. So you say that... You know, it picks up all this because it's initial scanner. Yeah. And then once it does it, it has the blueprint so it knows. Yes. But what happens after, you know, different situations and it scans over and over again? Will it just block out some of the new stuff? Or you great, know what I'm saying? Great question. That is when it starts taking shortcuts. So consider the first time you enter a new environment, that's the availability. Mm -hmm. It wasn't there before you entered it. Right. Now that you have, it's available to you. Your brain is like, okay, I understand what this is. The next step is accessibility. The brain wants to know, well, how often do, am I going to encounter this? Is it frequent? Because if it's frequent, I'm going to push it toward the front of the brain, which means you can retrieve it right away. Uh -huh. If it's infrequent, it's going back to the subconscious until needed. So, and it doesn't matter if it's a good frequent or a bad frequent? You Couldn't know care saying? less. Okay. The brain is not moral Don't at all. Don't care. Well, it's just giga. Garbage in, garbage out, good <laughs> okay. in, good out. And then the last step is now that the brain has seen it and it sees it frequently or infrequently, what do I do with it? That's the applicability. What do I do with this information? How do I apply it? So here's an example. My brother had a Jeep Wrangler. I'd never thought of one before. Val, you have a Jeep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I never thought of it before. Then when I see his, it's available to me. And I see it more frequently because I'm seeing my brother all the time. Now it's there all the time. It's in the front of my brain. I buy a Jeep. Do you know once I bought it, when I looked around, I'm like, oh, my God, there's so many people with a Jeep. I didn't know it. And I became right. part of the Jeep club. Uh -huh. Well, and you know, that's a very <laughs> exclusive club. Oh, yes, it is. My point Jeep Wrangler girls. My point is now I only then did I see them everywhere before I never noticed it. So here's I'm going to segue actually back to the bullying because this all matters. Okay. We have stereotypes about black people. Mm. Well, about all people. Mm -hmm. I'm going to focus on the black ones. And there, I mentioned last time there are six main ones that you see in the in the in the business in the music industry. Or and that's is great TV. because Raina, yeah. this yeah. is where you can chime in I too. I can. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So here's the main one. We have the mammy character. She is always asexual, like no interest whatsoever. She's usually fat. Obese, if you can get it. Mm -hmm. uh, she looks bestial, and she really, really, really loves white people and their children. And then when you think of her children, either you don't see them, or they hate her, or she hates them. Mm -hmm. Never a good mom. And, uh, of course, she trusts a lot in the Almighty God, and who of her is, of course, white. That's Mammy. That one won an Oscar. That's Hattie McDaniel and Gone with the Wind. Mm -hmm. Then when you get to the next one, Mammy, the opposite of Mammy is kind of the sapphire. She's the one who's going to roll her neck and get you told. Mm -hmm. And she's evil, stubborn, hateful, really hates black men in particular. She emasculates them, treats them like little boys. And she is the, what I didn't say last time is she is the core of the reason to hate black women. She gives them mm. reason. They always say, I date someone else because I can't stand your nasty attitude. That's mm. the sapphire stereotype. Mm -hmm. She messes it up for all true. of us. Yeah. She won an Oscar. Mm -hmm. That would be Octavia Spencer and The Help. Right. Then when we go to Jezebel, this one's huge. You, Valerie B. <laughs> is doing stuff in the studio, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> the Jezebel stereotype also won an Oscar. That's Halle Berry in Monsters Ball. I yeah. <laughs> she is, I guess I can't, she's the, how do you, you can't, w, the, the W word, right? The high yellow, red bone. Um, she doesn't have to be high well, yellow. Well, because she's she's mixed. Not necessarily. 
she what she is. You mean her role? Mm. Have the, I stereotype, <laughs> the stereotype actually is rooted in religion. Oh. All of the Abrahamic religions have a lot of misogyny. Mm. E- Eve is the evil one who tempted man and caused the fall of everyone. You're right. She's hypersexual. Look at her. You know, right. oh, you just, you know. I get it. Just sexy. Just temptress. Mm-hmm. Temptress. Well, the Jezebel stereotype in the United States was uh, what we don't know is th- she she justifies the rape of black women. Black women have been raped. When they were on the slave ships, they were told to walk around nude for easy access. Mm-hmm. Then when you get here, rape constantly during slavery. Jim Crow was 90 years. She was raped all through Jim Crow. And recently... Um, uh, what's her name? Oh, forgive me. Rosa Parks. Mm-hmm. Now that she's passed on, her estate has released her diaries. She fought off an attempted rape. The reason she was on the bus was not necessarily the civil rights movement. Black women had been being raped in the back of the bus <gasps> and at the wow. bus stops. Wow. She's, I'm not going back there to defend rape. She devoted a lot of her life to stop the rape of black women. Black women couldn't turn to the law because rape was only defined for white exactly. women. We couldn't turn to black men who were raping us to couldn't turn to white men couldn't turn to white women did but the white women had fear also of going against their own right. and some of them didn't care what ha- what have you there's no one who protected the black woman mm-hmm. no that is so interesting see what happens when you read yes. when you read yeah. and, and know things and so it makes you look at things completely differently it really and why are we just now learning this about the civil rights movement it says a lot so those are the stereotypes about the black women and i'll move on to black men here we have the main one who's the opposite of the I'll go Mammy. The opposite of Mammy is the Uncle Tom. Mm-hmm. He won an Oscar. I love you, Sidney Poitier, but I'm sorry. You were Uncle Tom in Lilies of the Fields. <laughs> <laughs> won an Oscar. Uncle Tom is the one who's completely fine with everything. Stop. Why don't you just forget slavery? Mm-hmm. It's your fault. Um, a lot of people might say black Republicans are this. They, they know they've been accused of this. Here's the one I'm going to step on toes, but ministers. The black Mm -hmm. minister was put in the slave church, distinct from the white church, just to do the minstrel show Mm -hmm. and say what the white masters wanted them to say. Mm -hmm. Often the white masters and mistresses were right there to make sure that he was saying what he was saying what he wanted to say, Uh which was always don't fight back, don't have a slave rebellion. This especially after the Haiti rebellion uh, in Haiti, to say it properly, where blacks turned away from white religion and back to voodoo, Mm -hmm. went in the upper hills, had a voodoo ceremony being drank pig's blood or whatever came down and killed 50,000 French and threw them out of the country. <laughs> well, I hated to go there. Well, and you know what? I, well, I it, actually didn't you hate have to go to there. Go it's there the Red Monroe. It, <laughs> right. It's, it's called the kettle black. It's kettle black. So that's what it's about. But you know what? I understand the way that you're putting it all into place. Mm-hmm. And, and actually, it, it's history. But it makes sense because once it's out there and you look at it, it's like, that makes all the sense of the world. Well, and also you get that it's a visceral gut level need to keep these stereotypes going. Right. It is. For it, now, let me say this for the white folks who might be listening. Black people can have be in, in have white supremacy and be in white face. Right. This thing is a psychological disease. Right. So it's not just let's just beat up on white people. It is the history. It's nasty enough as it is. Right. But my whole point is white supremacy is a disease. Right. It is. It's the actions. It's the way of thinking. It's exactly. That hurts right. white people, too. Right. Right. So that's the pro- So that was the Uncle Tom, opposite of Mammy. I'll, two more. Also, Mandingo is the opposite of the Sapphire. Mm. Mandingo. <laughs> so, King? Great. Well, I, let me tell you now. I saw Uh-oh. that movie. Why are you getting all excited? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did you see how you get all? <laughs> Mandingo. Now, <laughs> let me tell you. I'm going to say it the way I used to. I snuck and saw that movie did you mandingo when it came out of mm-hmm. course i was a little girl mm-hmm. and i'm telling you of course i didn't know everything that was going on in it but looking back now you know and, and knowing more of the history and what actually went on obviously in in the movies they're not telling you anything but mm-hmm. you know i was just so attracted to um the mandingo Who wouldn't be no he in was fact, a boxer wasn't he everyone this i don't know i haven't i can't yeah, well, you can't well, get Sociology has ruined my life. There's <laughs> nothing I can watch without analyzing it to death. It's over for me. <laughs> I can't get past it. But uh, Mandingo is the male Jezebel. King Kong <laughs> is the fear of the black phallus, the big black phallus taking over the, you know, the pure white woman. Literally King Kong. What is, the monkey, what is this gorilla doing in New York? 
No, but that but I'm saying so that was the other one and also uh he represents the fear of genetic annihilation for the white race. And there's the thing is after Mandingo, every woman supposedly in her right mind wants to take a spin at least once. But you gotta go because he has no power, no money, no status, he can't protect you, he wouldn't protect you anyway, he doesn't want his offspring. This is the Mandingo. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. I know, right? And that is still applies today right it still applies to this stereotype they're all over yeah the place. it's sad it's and really <laughs> yeah <laughs> everywhere yeah really. and so when you look at black men the thug is the male sapphire he's the one hypersexualized. Mm-hmm. he's the one with a nasty attitude he's the one with the hands up don't shoot after doing god only knows what <laughs> but this is the stereotype black women oh i wanted to say this for the sapphire she's she represents the white man's burden. There was actually a quote that said, if only we could send these black women back to Africa because she's a burden to us. And I was, I must rape her daily. And Is it's her w- fault because she's coming on to me. Oh. So here now you have the thug who's like, I know I stole the cigarettes, but hands up, don't shoot. This is why it's such a hot topic. Mm-hmm. The thug won an Oscar. This would be Denzel Washington in <laughs> Training Day. Yes. I don't know if Mandingo yes. ever got the Oscar though because we can't do white. No, I know he got the hot tub. Amount, no. <laughs> what? <laughs> he got the hot tub. <laughs> so no. I know I was going to relate to bullying, and I'll finish up here. Right. No, it's a point. I promise you. Mm-hmm. What I'm trying to show is that the brain <laughs> said diff- said just straight, and just bear with me, audience. People are stupid, and what I mean by that is our brains, the way we evolved evolved in such a way we are so brilliant compared to other animals we can handle so much stuff automatically Mm -hmm. until the fact that it's handled automatically makes us kind of dumb it's automatic processing so we're going to play a little game if i were to say to you uh swimsuit i want to see how quickly you relate this if i were to say swimsuit and skiing how how does that feel in your brain Hot and that, cold. But does it relate right away, or did you have to think? Oh, I had, you to, had think to think about which okay. one I wanted to be in. <laughs> but still, there you could feel your brain kind of slow down, like, well, what do I do with this? Now, swimsuit beach. Oh, it's automatic, s- right? We're, so we're swimming. Yeah, like, duh. Heat. Right. Party. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Happy. You see where I'm trying to go? Okay. Mm-hmm. Black woman. Happy. <laughs> you slowed down like molasses. <laughs> Okay, black woman angry. <laughs> it's quick, right? <laughs> I, I, is it? Why? Are you no, it, it is quick, but I think I'm just messing around. But it was easier for me, you know, the black woman yeah. angry rather than the black woman happy. Happy, yeah, because right. they right. don't ever show that really. This is your brain saying, "What's available to me is this first stereotype or first we call them heuristics. A swimsuit, okay, we know now the brain has seen a swimsuit. Now it wants to know that's available to the brain. Now the next step is how accessible is it? How often do you see the swimsuit? Often, right? And then how is it applied is always with the beach. So the brain's like swimsuit, beach, bam, one second, it can go on and do other things like keep your heart running, you know, work as a work on a disease somewhere. Yeah. The, the brain has a lot to do. When I say to the brain swimsuit snow, it's got swimsuit, it's accessible, I mean, uh, up, available, then it moves to accessibility. I know what it is. But when you put snow in there, it's like, what am I supposed to do with swimsuit and snow? This happens with ster- stereotypes, hmm. the mammy character. You know, when you see her, you know, automatically, yes, 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 you're, right. you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. So it's so, so automatic. So we expect that. Right. Mm-hmm. But then you throw in a Michelle Obama. No one knows what to do with her. No one. She went to right. Princeton. She went to Harvard. And also she has no problem planting her own garden. organic garden. And she loves all children. And she has her own and she loves them dearly. She destroys Mammy in every possible way. Right. Right. They try and throw the sapphire stereotype on her. True. And then she came out. What I love about Michelle Obama, she came out and said, I feel like a baby mama. You're not going to tell her what to do. Well, that's, that's what <laughs> she was like, saying. Well, she was saying that's how it feels because he's not he's not here. He's busy, whatever. And she doesn't care what you do with the sapphire stereotype. But clearly she's married. She has yet to roll her neck. <laughs> well, right. totally. I've never seen her roll a neck. Not a neck roll. No. Such a I've good. seen the eye snap, though. <laughs> yeah, she's done the eye snap. <laughs> I would be, too. <laughs> what My I love husband. about her, she's right. just human, though. She's just, exactly. I'm going to be me. Just human. Exactly. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, the Jezebel can't throw that on her either. She's married and you I mean, you just, it's hard. So she destroys she's it just by being herself. Right, right. right. And, you know, 
everything that you're saying again ties into a whole lot and again it brings a different perspective and allows us a different understanding Mm -hmm. you know and that's the thing when you break things down and you strive to learn more about things you know things are easier coming to you that you understand and you get that oh aha Mm -hmm. and so you know obviously you calling the kettle black is very is very helpful yeah i think it's the only thing we ever really need to do is look in the mirror Every time I want to point my finger at you because I like something or I don't, just turn that finger right back around and say, how am I this thing? How do I need to be this thing and I'm not? Or where is this unresolved in my past? Well, and two, and that could go with the bullying too. Because it's like, like you said, what did you say when you are are, are talking bad or see something negative about someone else? It's you. It's you. Mm -hmm. So the bullying, well, not so much that it's you, but this person, you know, doesn't like their self. You know, at all. And not that they didn't like Raina, because obviously they they were it was more than jealousy. But, you know, it was their insecurity because right. she That's is what, what they, they want it to look like to be to and be. look like, mm-hmm. you know. So they ostracized you mm-hmm. and had right. you thinking, you know, that there's something wrong with you. Right. Mm-hmm. So and Ren had a very I forgot the name of it. You, you talked about. It. Oh, cultural capital. Right. Is that what you're talking no. about? No. Oh. When you look at in the mirror or, you, you know, you, 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 you're thinking oh, negative. projection. Projection. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, projection. That's exactly. We're always, always looking in the mirror. Yeah. And so then you, you, I'm sorry. No, you you uh, become your thoughts. Mm-hmm. You know, you, mm-hmm. you are what you think, what you feed yourself. And if you're constantly fed negative things, you eventually, depending on how strong you are at the time, begin to believe that and mm-hmm. become that. And mm-hmm. then it just mm-hmm. suppresses you and. You well, and, into those stereotypes. and often, though, like when your bullies saw you, yeah, you re- immediately reflected back to them something that was missing for them. Mm-hmm. It's unconscious often. And so that anxiety right. that they feel, then they just displace it and, and take it out on you in these horrific ways. Mm-hmm. Speaking, one of your stories was that uh, it was over a boy, right? Right. Right. And it reminded me that actually back home, that I had a girl put a knife to my throat because one of my friends said, oh, I'll take you to prom. Oh. Just a friend, but she wanted the guy. Wow. I didn't tell my mom. Just like Valerie B. said, most folks don't tell their parents. Mm-hmm. And that's a, and that's really like, and nowadays she would have been arrested and carted off to jail. Uh, yeah. Rightfully so. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah. But with the bullying, and I'll, you know, in here, the reason that it applies to the three A's, what's mm-hmm. available, what's applicable, the stereotypes that we have. Right is that we live in a very sick society. Sigmund Freud, father of psychoanalysis, Hmm. came here in 1909. He made one trip and said, I will never go back. Get with this. He hated the United States so much in particular that he went back to Nazi Germany. He was a Jew. Mm -hmm. He went back to Vienna, to Nazi Germany, and said, I'd rather face that did and he, some of his property was seized he didn't care he I will never go back to that united states and he actually had friends from france rescue him and get, get him off to at least the uk or england wow. At the time. wow and the reason he hated it is that he says that all of our energy in this country is tied up in money it, and consumerism and status and he said it is completely sick so he dropped off psychoanalysis and he goes i've given them the devil and they don't even know why in other words take a look in the mirror right and he, w- he didn't even come back. He never came back. <laughs> never. Hmm. So what I'm pointing out to you is we have five things that operate in this society. There are more, but these are the ones that one is this Protestant work ethic. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Give 110 mm. percent. Right. That is rooted in complete poverty. It happened back during the break from the Protestant or Protestant church from the Catholic church. Main reason was for the Catholic people, they have a little help getting to God, which I could use. I mean, it's like you have sacraments, you have confession, you have, there's this sense that you're not completely alone. You've got but the communion. You, you have got things the you can pulp. do. To help. Yeah. yeah. Talk to him for us. Yeah. <laughs> the Pope. The Pope. Well, for the Protestant, Martin Luther, who was, an, well, I guess, modern-day attorney, we would call him, but he got angry at the Catholic Church because they allowed now money to also be a part. You can pay now your way. And they wanted to br- build the uh, St. Don't let me get St. Peter's Basilica. I might be saying it wrong. I'm not Catholic. Mm-hmm. The huge, gorgeous church. Right. right. Cathedral. And he's like, you don't add money now. So he breaks away in protest, Protestant. But what that means for the Protestant upon which the United States is built in particular is you're on your own. There is nothing to help you get to God. Nothing. 
Mm. You know what I mean? So that's one of the main things. Uh, and the other one is that we don't really champion emotional intelligence in this, in this society. We don't champion intellectualism. And uh, we worship things and consumerism. And finally, there's a lot of misogyny. So this right. is like a hot soup. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And when it gets to bullying, this is why everyone's trying to measure up to something they're never going to measure up to. Exactly. That that says it all right there. It really mm-hmm. does because we are all individuals and we're all our own person. So there's no help. No, <laughs> no whatsoever. It doesn't do anything. Wow. <laughs> so as usual, uh, Ren, yes. I want to thank you for allowing me to, to be on your show. Oh, this is yeah, sweet, Valerie. You know you're the reason show. I'm here. Thank you. And um, I th- we're, we're looking forward to uh, Kettle Black next week oh well thank Um, you so much i don't know she was what it's going to be on but i'll find something wonderful